Uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about basic contract principles. Let's start out with a definition of a contract. A contract is simply an agreement between the parties. I think we all pretty much understand that. The unique thing about a construction contract, however, is it envisions or contemplates the possibility that it will be modified, changed. Let me illustrate that point with a little example. Let's say you went to buy a car and uh, you couldn't find a car you liked on the lot. So you went into the uh, car salesman, the sales associate, and uh, you made arrangements to order a car. And they went through the order form and the, uh, one of the first questions the uh, associate asked you was, well, what color would you like? And you, you go through their list of colors and you conclude that Seattle silver is the color for you. So they fill out the form, Seattle silver. And they go a little bit further down in the form and they ask you what kind of seat covers you'd like. And you say leather, I'd like leather seats. Check off leather. And they keep going a little bit further down and they ask you if you'd like a moon roof and you say, of course, I want the best. So they complete the form, you offer your deposit, they tell you the car will be ready in four weeks and eight weeks later they give you a call and the car is ready. You run down to the the auto dealership and you run into the showroom and you grab the associate because you really want to see this new car and he takes you out on the lot and you see a red car not Seattle silver red not exactly what you ordered and you look at the associate and you said so what's with the red and the associate said well let me tell you a little bit about that Seattle silver now you live here in Texas and you know sun beats down on that car every single day that it's not in the garage and uh, it tends to wash out that Seattle silver. It just hasn't held up well in a Texas environment. We substituted red. We think you'll like it better. It costs the same. Well, you don't want a red car, but you know, it is here in front of you and you would at least like to sit down. So you open the door and you get in and it's cloth seats. And you look at the associate again, and he knows the question you're going to ask, and he starts off right away, and he says, you know, uh, that leather, you know, leather these days this just isn't what it used to be. You know, leather is now a veneer, and they kind of glue it to cloth, and again, this tough Texas environment, we found that that little lamination just doesn't work the way that we'd all hoped it would, and we substitute a cloth. We think you'll be happier with it. Didn't have the guts to tell him it would be the same price, but in any event, they kept uh, the, uh, the person buying the car, uh, uh, got into the car. And it was one of those kinds of days when you'd really like to have the no moonroof. So the question I have is, does the person who ordered that car have to take delivery? And I think most of you would say, and certainly I would agree with you, the answer is no, absolutely not. It's not what you ordered. It's not what the deal says. If you look at the sales agreement, it doesn't say, and the auto company can substitute anything they want at any point and the person still has to buy the car. That's not at all what it says. But that's not a de the deal that a contractor signs when they sign on to a project. Typically, the contract, it makes it, the contract makes it very clear that not only does the owner have a right to make changes, but they have a right to make changes in the contractor has to perform the project as if those changes were always in the contract. Now, there could be in a contract price adjustment, of course, but they still have to complete the project. As a matter of fact, if it's bonded, the surety is tied to this change as well. So construction contracts are different from the sort of everyday contract we deal with by nature of the changes clause. And most, well, as a matter of fact, I think we can say all construction contracts have a changes clause. It's a clause that allows the owner to make revisions. Now I think in terms of contracts, and probably this is true of any contract, but uh, it can certainly be true of construction contracts, you need to keep in mind what island you're on. Another story. So you decide you're not going to buy the car. You decide that instead you're going to go on vacation to the Bahamas. So you go down to the Bahamas and you're reading through the real estate page and you see that you know there's an island for sale. Lots of islands in the Bahamas. And you think to yourself, wow, you know, this money that I was going to use to buy a car, I can now use to buy an island. So you do that. You buy yourself an island and the launch drops you off on, the, uh, 
on your new island and you're walking around and you're saying, you know, it's, it's kind of like my own country. I, I think I'll write some laws. So you sit down and you write up a long list of laws that govern behavior on your new island slash country. Um, a friend of yours comes to visit and they get off the launch and they're walking around and you meet them and hand them your list of laws and they read through them and you know, just some of them don't make any sense. Well, where are they going to go on your island with your laws to find out what you meant when you wrote them? They're going to have to ask you. So you're going to be in the role of not only writing the laws, but interpreting those laws. What, do you, what did you really mean? Now, let's say this friend of yours, after they've read through these list of laws and realized that maybe they're in violation of one or two already, thinks that this is just not right. And they want to appeal a decision that they violated the law. Well, where are they going to go? Oftentimes, they're going to go to you. Because it's your island, you wrote the laws, you interpreted them, and where else are they going to go on your island in terms of figuring out where you getting justice, I guess it is. Well, there are lots of contracts in the construction industry, certainly many public contracts, where that's exactly the circumstance the contractor often finds himself. The owner, public agency, for example, and most owners, I think, would fall in this category, wrote the contracts. They're going to be the interpreters of the contracts, so their on-site representatives are. And many of them have sort of an in-house adjudication or appeals process whereby if you believe that you've been wronged, you have to appeal to them. This puts that kind of an owner in a pretty strong contractual position and that means something when we uh, start thinking about uh, you know, contract interpretation uh, and determining how you would read or interpret or enforce a contract. The last thing we should think about when we're thinking about contracts is that a contract is a legal document. It throws us into the legal sphere of things. So we should always make sure that when we're reviewing a contract or we're dealing with a contract, that we understand the law that governs contracts. Now, with that, let's talk a little bit about contract interpretation, the law of contract interpretation. You know, probably one of the basic laws of contract interpretation or rules of contract interpretation, maybe that's a better word, is that you have to read the contract as a whole. You can't take particular provisions out of context and not consider the entire set of contract documents when evaluating your obligations as a, either a contractor or your obligations to the contractor as an owner. So. You have to consider what the plans and specs and the notes in the plans and specs say. You have to consider what the specifications, both general and special and et cetera, mean. Uh, the technical specifications that might be referenced in another location. Any supplemental documents provided as contract documents. Whether or not the borings or other geo uh, technical information that might be provided is a, a contract document. All of these things have to be read as a whole. They have to be considered as a whole. Now you might say, well, you know, won't the contract say that? Well, no, they won't. Oftentimes, this is an implicit contract requirement. It's not necessarily explicitly stated in the contract itself. It's more of a legal principle that governs contract interpretation, and that is that you have to read the contract as a whole. Now, the reality is, is that sometimes contracts have conflicts in them, ambiguities, errors, omissions, and there are rules about how we interpret or enforce uh, contracts as it relates to these items. Now, first of all, we should probably define each one of these items. Let's define, for example, ambiguity. Ambiguity is kind of a tough one. Ambiguity means that a contract provision has more than one reasonable interpretation. Uh, sort of a simple example is uh, the following note on a set of bridge deck rehabilitation plans. They said, the note said, remove four inches to sound concrete, meaning remove four inches of concrete. Um, down to sound concrete. Now, what does that mean? 
does it mean remove a maximum of, of four inches or stop when you get to sound concrete, meaning the most you'd ever remove would be four inches? Or does it mean remove a minimum of four inches and then continue on down until you find sound concrete? So is this a maximum or a minimum? Well, both interpretations are probably reasonable. So you might ask the question, well, okay, if both interpretations are reasonable, which one governs? Well, the person who wrote the contract has an obligation to everybody who signs the contract to draft it in a way that's not ambiguous. So ambiguities are typically ruled against the drafter. You're not going to find that written in the contract. It's an implicit requirement or an implicit rule of contract interpretation. Uh, but it's no less real. Similarly, if, what if there was a conflict in the, in the contract documents, meaning that one document in the specification say said one thing, and another document, say the plan, said another? Which one governs? Well, most construction contracts address that problem by having a, a, what's called a coordination clause, where they actually tell you which one governs. Some might say the plans take precedence over the specifications, and other might say the specifications take precedence over the plans, but the bottom line is, Oftentimes, um, conflicts between documents are addressed by a coordination clause. Now, what if the conflict is in the document itself? Typically, that would be seen as an error, uh, subject to some rules we're going to talk about here in a second. Uh, in other words, it would be ruled against the drafter. It would be ruled against the person who created the conflict when they drafted the contract. Similarly, if the contract documents are in error, the person responsible for that error becomes the person who drafted the contract documents. Um, there's a particular kind of an error called an omission, whereby something's left out. And we don't know, the contractor doesn't know that it has to be installed. Now, the reason we make a, a kind of carve out omissions as a special kind of error is because if you were ever going to try and hold your design consultant responsible for this omission in the plans and specifications, the way we calculate damages for omissions is different from the way we might calculate it for other kinds of errors. Again, subject to the law of your state and your jurisdiction. So I said that uh, in terms of determining the party responsible for ambiguities, uh, uh, conflicts, and other errors and omissions, uh, there were some other considerations as it related to contract interpretation. Those other considerations have to do with, I'm going to use two words here, patent and latent. Latent, they're both Latin words. Latent means hidden. And patent means obvious. If the error, the ambiguity, the omission, the conflict is obvious and should have been detected by the contractor prior to offering their bid and signing the contract, then they really have an obligation to make the owner aware of that error prior to sign the contract, and they don't really have a right to take advantage of that error in their bid price or in the administration of the contract. So essentially what happens is that if the error is, whether it be ambiguity or conflict or omission or some other kind of error, if it's obvious on its face, when the contractor prepares the contract documents, they have to make the owner aware of this error. Uh, and if they don't, they perhaps could even become responsible for the additional costs or problems or difficulties associated with it. Again, probably not stated in the contract, but a, a, a rule of contract interpretation. The second uh, word that I talked about was latent. If the problem in the contract documents was hidden and not something a contractor would have been able to detect when they were putting their bid price together, then presumably uh, they would be entitled to recover the cost of correcting that error once it's discovered after the contract is uh, signed and the work begins. So patent and latent, obvious or hidden, has a bearing in terms of our evaluation or understanding of the contract. Sometimes there's a question about uh, whether trade custom and usage, uh, usage, the industry standard, applies in the evaluation of the acceptability of work versus you know, what the contract says. And typically the way that's resolved is that the contract is clear about what the contractor is obligated to do, 
the owner is well within their rights to set a standard higher than the industry standard, and it becomes the contractor's obligation to meet that standard. So really, uh, industry standards or trade custom and usage only comes into play when the contract itself is silent on the subject. <clears throat> There's also a basic assumption that uh, goes into uh, contracts and the interpretation and evaluation of contracts that relates to uh, basically the presumptions that the parties uh, will deal with each other fairly. Uh, I think it's called good faith and fair dealing, the concept of good faith and fair dealing. And each party has a right to expect that kind of uh, treatment by the other party to the contract. There's also this idea that the parties will fulfill their basic obligations, sometimes even if they're not explicitly stated in the contract. For example, if an owner hires a contractor to build a building, even though the contractor doesn't explicitly say it, there's a presumption that the contractor will be able to gain access to the site so that the project can be built. So there's a, there's a presumption that access will be provided. There's also a basic presumption that the owner fulfilled their obligations to do things like review shop drawings and submittals and uh, other submittals and turn them around in a reasonable amount of time. So there's a, and there's a basic reasonable presumption on the part of the contractor that the owner will fulfill these obligations. Again, even though they're maybe not explicitly stated in the contract. So those are some basic uh, contract principles as it relates to construction contracts, uh, contracts in general, and some basic rules of interpretation. So just to recap, um, we've been talking about contracts and construction contracts. We've concluded and shown that a contract is an agreement between parties. We've noted that a construction, is contra construction contract is different because of the changes clause or the clause within the contract that allows it to be modified. We've noted that a contract is a legal document and governed by legal rules of interpretation. We've talked about some of those rules of interpretation, like we've defined what an ambiguity is. It's a, a provision in the contract that has more than one reasonable interpretation. We've noted what conflicts are. We've noted what uh, errors are. We've Kind of shown that an omission is a special kind of error, and we've concluded that the party responsible for all of these problems is the party that drafted the contract. Again, and these are implicit rules, they're not necessarily stated explicitly in the contract. We've noted that the contractor is obligated to build the project in accordance with the specifications. If the specifications are silent, then industry standard might apply. We pointed out that each of the parties have an obligation to treat the other fairly. Uh, I think good faith and fair dealing was a phrase that we used. And we've pointed out that, uh, in fact, in terms of fulfill to performing the contract work, the parties have certain basic obligations that may, again, may not be specifically stated, like the owner's responsibility to provide access. <clears throat> 